Good afternoon, and once again, this is COMP 422, COMP 620, Information Privacy and Security. Uh, review of the schedule coming up. Uh, today, I'm talking about election security, and we have a guest speaker. Katie Cloud is here from uh, Lincoln Financial Group to talk to us. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, two days from now is a wellness day. So be well and don't come to class. There are no classes on Wednesday. If you come here, you'll be along because I won't be here. Uh, next week, week from today, we're talking about malware. That's all the nasty things. And then denial of service a week from Wednesday. Okay. All right. That's the schedule. Very good with that. All right. We're going to talk about elections. Uh, some security, more about how it works. Uh, yes. In order to vote in the United States, you have to be a citizen and you have to be 18 years or older and meet the state's residency requirement. Uh, just to get a little political, there is a ballot initiative uh, going on today that says that very same thing, even though there are already laws that require it. So I don't know why it's there. Uh, OK, you have to be registered to vote. You have to go down to the Board of Elections. There are several places you can do this, DMV, and register to vote. It's claiming that prove that you're a citizen. Uh, and then once you're registered, you can continue to vote as long as you keep voting every four years or so. Uh, uh, note that voting is secret. Nobody can see how you vote, including the election workers. So how you vote is secret. It's not always been that way in the United States, but it is now required that your, election, your vote be secret. Nobody knows what it is. And every vote is equal. So for Election security, these are our goals. These are our goals to ensure that we follow these rules. In particular, your vote is secret, which must be registered, and votes count equally. Many of you I know have voted before. Uh, I have voted frequently in every election since I was 18. Uh, I now work as a precinct judge. I help run the elections on November 5th, hand out ballots and check people in and stuff like that. Uh, and I can tell you, everybody wants to make sure that their ballot is counted fairly. That's a big issue these days. So quick facts about uh, elections in North Carolina. There's been no evidence of a successful attack against the election system in North Carolina. So it's working pretty well. We use paper ballots. Uh, I hand out the pens to the people, I tell them these pens have been carefully screened and we know it's going to mark the way you want it marked. Uh, we have voting machines that have been certified. The voting machine, well, okay. The uh, pallet, paper ballots obviously have no network connection. You run them through a machine that tabulates them, it has no network connection. They are tested to make sure that they work carefully. Uh, trained officials, that would be me, have to go to training a couple of times to uh, make sure you know just how the rules work. Uh, there are audits. We'll talk about that. And there's an investigations division here in North Carolina that looks into problems. There are many different voting systems throughout the United States. Voting is very distributed. Each state, county runs the elections themselves. Even though you have a national election to elect national positions, it's down to There are some federal rules about how the elections work. But primarily, it's run by the folks here in the county. Uh, there are, in the United States, there are over 100,000 polling places. Uh, remember, in a few slides later, I think there's 130-some uh, polling places here in Guilford County. There are about a million people like myself involved in running the elections, making sure that everything gets tabulated correctly. Uh, and now this, of course, makes life difficult and people complain that the uh, we need to have more centralized control over all the elections. But on the other hand, from a security standpoint, it's so different that if you're trying to break in, you have to break in to all thousands and thousands of different county systems, each of which is different. That's going to be a challenge. So voting machines are generally isolated Again, they use machines to tabulate the paper ballots here in Guilford County, I think throughout the state. Uh, those machines are separate. They report, we then take all that information, give it to the county. The county then 
uses their computers to aggregate the information, which is then goes to the state, which well goes to the state a little later on. Eventually, the state makes a decision and they specify uh, electoral college representatives to go to Washington, D.C. And I think it's, well, it was January 6th, four years ago, everybody knows that day, that they go and report to Congress and tell how each state has voted. Uh, so it's, it's a federated, federated system. Here in Guilford County, uh, I mentioned Charlie Collicutt is the director of Guilford. I went and interviewed him a couple of years ago, I talked to him about computer security. Uh, yes, he feels pretty confident that systems run securely. Uh, there are 100, 134 polling places in North, just in Guilford County. So they're all over the place, lots of them. That's 134 places that will be open on November 5th. There are some of the places are open for early voting, but not 134 of them, only about a dozen of them, I believe. There are a lot of voters in North Carolina, 7 million some voters in North Carolina, although only 73.35% uh, of them voted last uh, presidential election. Now, it's always interesting to look at the party affiliation. The biggest party is no party at all, unaffiliated, people who are not registered for any party. And then the Democrats slightly outnumber the Republicans. Uh, but go ahead and see who gets elected. Uh, then there are other parties. It's interesting to note, if you go and vote for president, there are six people running for the United States president on the North Carolina ballot. Uh, everybody knows the Democrats and Republicans, but there are four other minor parties that are running people. In order to vote, you have to be registered, as I mentioned. You have to go down and show them that you're a citizen, show them that you are here to have a uh, to live in North Carolina or live in Guilford County. You got to show them name, your address, date of birth. Uh, they want some identification. They like your driver's license or the last four digits of the social security number. Uh, or you need this information to prove that, prove who you are. Once you get registered, then you only have to show one ID uh, at the voting locations in order to say, yes, this is me. We'll get to that shortly. In North Carolina, you can do same day registration to early voting. And I might point out early voting runs until Friday of this week. So right now, in fact, today, I think A&T had a voting event, voting party earlier this afternoon, uh, and they were having people register and voting. After Friday, if you haven't registered, well, you're out of luck. Because next week, when you people vote on Tuesday, November 5th, you cannot register. You must be registered already. In fact, last day, interestingly, the last day to register was almost a month ago, unless you're early doing same-day registration, in which case you can register this week, but not next week. So we have a question coming up here for uh, everybody. Let's run the polls here. Okay, uh, where are you? There we are. All right, out there. Okay. Okay, let's see the cards. Yeah, do up my right and right. Press your hand up. Are we ready? Okay, got it. Gotcha. Okay. Come on. Okay. All right. Uh, almost everybody voted. Uh, almost everybody voted B. False. In general, that is the uh, situation. The uh, I think we've talked about them. The CISA, Cyber Security, Info, Cyber and Information Security Agency of the United States as a voter registration list uh, rules for maintaining integrity of the votes. I have a friend who works in Guilford County, uh, 
uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics. He, he runs that operation. I called him up and said, well, do you report when people die to the voting people? And he said, no. And he called over the voting people. How do they know? Well, they know when people tell them that, tell them that they're dead. Uh, <laughs> there, there are forms when you go to an election, it's a small form on the table that nobody has ever used in my experience in the last seven, eight years I've been doing this. Nobody's ever filled one out that says, oh, a close relative has died. So I'm unsure how they really know, because if you're dead, obviously you can't vote. Uh, but you have, remember you have to bring ID. So you have to bring an ID for the dead person. Yes, question. Okay, votes. There are also mail-in votes. Yes, mail-in and mail-in votes. The mail-in votes, you have to have ID also. You have to get a photocopy. Your ID has to be signed by two, uh, either a notary public or two witnesses. Of course, you know, let's say you're really trying to game the system. If you're trying to do something illegal, uh, then you could have the ID of a dead person and get two co-conspirators, and you might be able to pull it off. Uh Remember, of course, that's a felony. Yes. All right, moving on. Okay. Okay, so let's be quick go over what happens when you vote, because this is what I do on the next Tuesday. By the way, it's a fun 14-hour day for those of us who work for the voting. Uh, you come in there, and so at the table is going to ask you for your ID. We'll go over IDs a little bit more. By the way, your a and ID works. A and T school IDs or driver's license. We see more driver's licenses than anything else. Yes, question. Yeah. Oh no, throughout the state, your A and T ID will work throughout the state. Uh, you have to vote at your precinct. Now, on early voting, you can go to any voting place in Guilford County and vote, but on election day, you must go to your precinct, or they'll tell you go someplace else. We, we we look up if you're there and you're not in your right precinct. We can figure out where you're supposed to be, and we send you off to, to go to your right precinct, uh, unless unless it's at the last minute. Now, if it's just before the polls close, then we'll let you do a provisional vote. Vote, which we'll talk about. Uh, again, might point out it is a class one felony to misrepresent yourself. Okay, so you come up. You have to state your name out loud. State law requires that you speak your name out loud. Uh, and then we look it up in our notebook. A notebook has a sticker for every voter, unless it says early voted. If you have early voted or absentee ballots, then it says that on the sticker. And you don't have, well, you don't have a sticker. Just print on it. Then we take your stick. No, this is a, this is a uh, sticker with information about you. We then put this on a authorization to vote form, which is a small half page form. Uh, then you, si you sign the form. The authorization to vote form has the information, including if it's a primary, what party you're in. The party that you're registered in is public knowledge, by the way, and that's listed on the form. That's important in primaries because on a primary, you get the proper ballot on this election, everybody gets the same ballot in your precinct, so no, not a problem. So you sign that form, uh, and then you give it back. Then you walk over and give it to somebody else who will give you a ballot for that vote. Right? You give them the authorization to vote form, and they give you a ballot, and they send you off to a voting uh, little small table that we have, little small pop up tables that we have. And there's a pen there, and you circle it. It's like those little tests. You circle in, you color in the circle for your selections. Typically, on most of the elections, you can only select one candidate per race. I don't think in this election there are any candidates, although in other elections there are multiple, you can choose multiple candidates. We have a question. Somebody makes a sale and they had a, um, one of the races that you can vote for different. Oh, okay. Somebody says, in Winston-Salem, there is a multiple choice. You can vote for multiple people. Uh, I looked at the ballot, at least the ballot in my precinct. There's no vote for more than one. There's sometimes, and I know on the primary elections, there were several 
vote for more than once. Typically, you can only get to vote on one. Uh, and then once you have circled in all the places you want to vote, then you put the you go over to a, a machine, it's a DS200, in case anybody cares to know, uh, and you slide your ballot in. By the way, it can go in any way, top, bottom, forward, backwards. It slides in, and it checks to see that you have not voted more than you should. And then it, if it likes the ballot, it drops it down into a container inside the box and records your vote. If you've made a mistake in that you have uh, voted more than once when you're not allowed to vote more than once, it will ask you, do you want to uh, try again? Or do you want to uh, just forget that race? Say you didn't, you, you voted for two people for dog catcher and you don't really care who's dog catcher. You can say, oh, and all your other uh, choices will count, but your dog catcher, cho catcher choice will not count. Uh -huh. If though you choose to try again, the ballot comes back. You give it to the uh, chief judge who writes void over the ballot, get, gives you a fresh ballot. Uh, we have to take that ballot and put it into an envelope. Uh, we're required to account for every ballot. Every ballot that came to us, we have to return back. And so if you screw it up, you're, by the way, you can only screw it up four times. That's it. After three times, we're going to talk to you about filling this out correctly. Uh, but you can only do it four times, so don't don't make lots of mistakes. Okay, after the polls close, after we say the polls are officially closed, go over the machine and we type in the right commands to close the polls. It stops counting and then it, comes, it uh, writes the results of the election or the summary of everybody who's voted in that precinct onto a USB thumb drive. It also prints out two paper tape copies of it. These are something like a cash register tape, and it prints out two of them, uh, which give the results of all the people who voted in that election. And if you wrote in any ballots, in a couple of places, there are write-in opportunities, not for every election, but some places you can vote in. It has a kind of picture of that we voted for. Yes. Anybody you want to. That okay. The question was, what happens if everybody votes for somebody who wasn't even running? That has happened. I was listening on the news. Some some soul wasn't running, and in some small town, everybody voted for him because they didn't like they didn't like the choices. I, I can understand an election where nobody likes the choices, uh, and so everybody voted for for that guy, and he won. And he, but, but I wasn't running. And so after you get, they gave him a week to think about it, and he decided that no, he wasn't going to do it. That he didn't want the position, and so he recommended everybody vote they, that they vote again. And he, I think, he found somebody who was willing to vote, willing to run, people willing to vote for him. But yes, that can happen. And I can tell you, Mickey Mouse gets a lot of votes. Uh, okay, but don't do that. No, don't wish you know. Vote, Responsibly, but I when we print out these paper ballots. A couple, two of the judges have to sign their name on it, saying this is it. One of the paper ballots goes to the chief judge, along with all the ballots, and everything downtown that night. The other one, another another judge takes the other one, puts it in an envelope, and mails it in U.S. mail to the election office. So it gets there by two different routes. Uh, the paper ballots, the ones that you have marked. That dropped into the bottom of the machine. We then, in the pre all three judges, you know, all three judges working together, looking at each other, make sure nobody's cheating, picks up the ballots, put them into a box, put a seal over it, and sign the seal. And then that box of ballots goes with the chief judge downtown, uh, who delivers it to the bo county board of elections. Now, the vote counting machines are programmed by the Guilford Board of Elections personnel. They don't have any outside contractors. You know, uh, Charlie Collicutt and uh, his helpers, uh, Craig Fox, in case anybody knows who Craig Fox is, uh, also helps. Uh, and they do that because the machines need to know what who you're voting for. 
I might point out that the machines that also they use laptops to program these, these laptops do not have any network connections. They're stored in a safe when they're not being used. Now, after the election, and within the next couple of days, they do an audit. They will randomly choose some precinct and they'll take all those ballots and they'll run them through a vote counting machine, a different vote counting machine than the type of vote counting machine that counted them originally. Uh, and it will check what the results were and they will compare the results that the separate vote counting machine got from the results that were given to them by the precinct and see if they match. Assuming that they match, and they of course should, then everything's fine. If they don't match, then they've got a situation and they'll have to work on that. They have not had that problem. There are people who propose that we uh, count them by hand. Some people like to see paper ballots and then have them publicly counted by hand. Somebody's on a stage. And I, I'm not sure what they imagine. Some little old ladies going, you know, one for Fred, another one for George, and go on like that. Uh, and that there is a transparency, you know, they'll be with you that. But uh, that may not work real well. First of all, machines are much more accurate than humans at counting. I can, yeah, that's been tested multiple times. Also, let's do some arithmetic here. I took my ballot and I counted the number of races on the ballot. How many different races do you have? There, there are 35 races on the ballot. There are 285,595 ballots were cast in 2020, probably going to be more this year. So look at 300,000 ballots. So do the maths. 7 million race ballot counts that you have counts that you have to do. That's going to be a long time if you're going to do it by hand. Uh, you might not get it done by uh, nine, 10 days after the election, uh, which is important because 10 days after the election, the county must report the results of the election to the state. And the state accumulates all of these where the state legislature will then select a slate of uh, college of electoral college representatives to go to Washington. Now, on election night, of course, you can watch television, listen to the radio, and hear how the elections are going. How do they know? Because the county is reporting the information that they get as they get it. But it's unofficial. This is unaudited. It's unofficial. The official results come in. There may also be some, some late returns. Now, in North Carolina, mail-in ballots have to be uh, received on election day, except there are uh, some, ex some exceptions. Soldiers who are uh, in some other country mailing their things, they can be several days late. They give exceptions for that, the federal law. Now, poll observers, you cannot hang around the election uh, and watch people vote. That's not allowed. Part of it's secrecy? No. If you're not, you can be there and you can vote, then you have to leave. That's it. You may not observe the polling. Now, the political parties can have observers. An observer has to be assigned by the political party. They have to be approved previous to the start of the election. As election judge, I get a list of who potential observers will be for my precinct. Fortunately, my precinct, nobody's ever had, we have not had any observers and I'm happy of it. Yes. Sometimes the people, like when I went to go vote, there are like people saying like, hey, where was the Democrats? No, no, they have to be silent. No, you can have people out front staying 50 feet or more away from the door. That That's also a law, stay 50 feet or more away from the door. And they can you know, hold up signs and suggest that you vote for, for me or, and all those things. That's that's allowed. Once you walk in the 50-foot line, they cannot. So inside the polling place, a poll observer is somebody appointed by the party who sits quietly there and watches it. Uh, one of the things they can do is that they can object to somebody and say, you know, if I go to the vote, they can say, no, you're not Ken Williams. And I can say, yes, I am. They say, no, you're not. Or they can say, you voted uh, 
in Idaho. And I can, no, I didn't, but they can say that. And uh, then you have to resolve that. Uh, chief judge, there is a process for the chief judge to resolve any objections to somebody voting. And they're there, of course, to watch. They can watch, they can take notes, they cannot take notes. Also, they can look at the uh, authorization to vote forms that you filled out with your name and put those in. They're, they're allowed to review that, which only say that you have voted, but nothing else. The fact that you voted is public knowledge. Okay. Uh, and I mentioned they can't speak, they can't get in the way, they can't watch, they can't campaign, they cannot watch you vote, they can't, particularly can't see how you did vote. Uh, those of us with gray beards may remember in the days before electronics, uh, they had voting machines that were all mechanical. You uh, had the little switches that you pulled down, uh, or, you know, they also, North Carolina no longer allows you to vote on a party basis. They used to, but they decided that they didn't want to. Uh, I won't say, but the, the party that least frequently people voted for on by the party basis chose not to allow that. Uh, so you can't do that anymore. Uh, you went in there, there was a great big handle there, and you walked in and you moved that handle to the side and that closed the curtain and it started. Then you push down all the little levers. When you're done, you move that big handle back to the other position and that then all your selections were put into mechanical counters that counted. And there's a lock with the back, back door of the machine. You unlock that and you can see all the counters. And so that's what. And then at the end of the day, the election officials unlocked the back. They could look at the counters and they wrote them down in the forms. Of course, voting by mail has become very popular uh, as well as early voting. Uh, voting by mail, remember you have to be secret. They have to be received by a specific date. That, that date varies, of course, by state. Here in North Carolina, it must be by election day. And ballots may often be dropped off in boxes. Uh, I don't know if we have mail election boxes in North Carolina. They do in some states. Um, almost all states allow early voting. You can do mail. And in person early voting in all these green states, you can see it's North Carolina's there. Uh, early in person voting, we didn't do it by mail, the other ones. And then there are a couple marked in red, which is not a political choice, by the way. It's just, I got this from here, but they, you can see Alabama, Mississippi, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, if my geography is any good, uh, doesn't allow early voting. Early voting has become very popular, as you can see here in this chart, used to be. Long ago, everybody vote not that not that long ago. I mean, I've been voting way over on the other side of the graph, uh, where everybody voted on election day in those old machines. But now there are more by mail early voting. Well, here's early voting mail. I think in Gilhead County, early voting's become more popular than mail-in voting. So let's ask another question just to uh and lots of lots of bees. Well, yes. Oh, about twice as many bees as A's. You can see online. Uh, yes, the answer is in fact uh, B. Remember that early voting, you have to, or to mail in ballots, you have to identify yourself. And it might be possible to. Again, as you talk about dead people voting, you might be able to vote if you had the driver's license of your grandfather or something and a couple of co-conspirators to go with it. But in general, no. But also remember- They would have to not know that they were dead. <laughs> well, they'd have to be, you know, if you had, you were going to defraud the system and you had two co-conspirators who were gonna help you defraud the system, which by the way, all three of you would be committing a felony. Uh, yeah, but they would have to know that 
whoever you're trying to determine your yes and they're also the, the if well you know if the body was warm over there in the corner yeah. uh it is interesting by the way what if you early vote and then you die and the answer to that question is if it's reported to the board of elections you voted if you early voted they don't know how you voted but if you voted by mail they have they've still got your envelope and those find your envelope and pull it out if, if you voted by mail and you die and they report it. Okay. So yes, complicated. Okay. Foreign, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, okay. The country intervening with most foreign elections is the United States. The United States has interfered more than anybody else, uh, followed by Russia and then China and Iran. Uh, I always find it interesting that everybody thinks the people who are going to interfere with our elections Countries that people seem like they don't like. Does Canada interfere with our elections? They probably, Canadians probably have some concern about who gets elected. Do you think they do anything about that? Well, I don't know. Uh, okay. Oh. All right. Like, it's like we intervene. Is it more so like, I know like there's times where the United States is going places and help us. No, well, okay. I'm not talking about Jimmy Carter going there and helping to ensure the elections are free and fair. No. Uh, which, by the way, Jimmy Carter frequently went and tried to help elections that are free, sure they're free and fair. Uh, no, I'm talking about mm, the CIA operating covertly to try to change the elections. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, in Russian probing, previously the uh, 2020 election, there were People trying to do things. And at one point, yes, somebody was caught. Uh, for us, they know no election results. Uh, we don't do that because just ask that. Uh, in the United States and North Carolina, we primarily have a two-party system. Although I did mention there are six parties running uh, candidates for president. Uh, oh, it's the Constitution Party, the Green Party, uh, a couple other parties that I can't remember. Uh oh. Uh, people online, you still there? Uh, Mr. Caesar, say something. We're still here. Yeah, okay, still here. well, oh, you're still there? Yeah. Thank you. I just got a note that the network was unstable. All right. Yeah, it's all right over here. Okay, well, hold tight. Uh, all right. Uh, number of candidates. Well, usually two, sometimes one. I, on my ballot, I noticed that almost all the judges were running unopposed. That was very interesting. Uh, okay. Sometimes you need runoff elections, particularly in primaries. We have lots of people running and there's run. So how, some systems require that the winner would get more than 50% of the vote. Well, what if nobody gets more than 50 votes? There are alternate voting. There's ranked choice voting systems where instead of voting, just circling in the circles, I want this person, and then ignoring all the others, you can number them and say, I want this person first, this person second, this person third. And that's usually about as far as it goes. And then they use several systems to see who gets the most votes. Yes, a question. Some places where there's voting from the codes, how do those work? Like if yeah. you're just really, really throwing up those names and you don't get 50% of the votes. Oh, no. Uh, or like actually you'd be getting 100%, right? Yes, okay, since there's only one only one, one little circle to fill in, I suppose if you vote for, for yourself and you're the only person to vote at all for yourself, everybody else have to leave it blank, you'd get it. Because you get, yes, just more than, well, yes, if it's unopposed, you're gonna win. Okay, there's, okay, ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is used in several locations, it's big in Alaska, I know, in Maine, uh, oh, and Hawaii. They uh, allow it on statewide elections. It's not on the presidential elections, but the statewide elections. People have been thinking about this for a long time. This fellow way back in the 1700s had systems, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. Instead, I'm going to mention that, because we're here, Wednesday, no classes on Wednesday. Don't come here on Wednesday. Don't go to any other class on Wednesday. A week from today, we'll be talking about malware, which, by the way, is chapter 23, in case anybody reads the book. And then a week from today is denial of service, which is chapter 7. 
But right now, we're going to move on to our guest speaker for today. That's, uh, unless anybody has any questions about this, security. Uh, guest speaker is Katie Claude. She is a director of IT Enterprise Solutions at Lincoln Financial Group. Lincoln Financial is the people who have the building downtown with the clock on the top. Clock and temperature, that, that, that's Lincoln Financial. Yes, that's where she comes from. And she's going to talk to you about interviewing. So we will, let's see. Okay, we're going to stop sharing the screen because there's nothing to see here. And you can hopefully see Ms. Oops. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. And uh, oh, I need to stand there so the online. Yes, people the camera's can see. right there. And uh, it's not, it should be. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, you're a little tall. No, you're a lot a little taller. taller. taller yeah. okay. <laughs> all right. I'm used to wandering around as I talk. So we'll see how I do standing still. So. Hi, everybody. Um, so like you said, I'm Katie Claude, and uh, I am a director of IT. And uh, Ken and I have known each other for many years. And uh, over the summer, we were talking about his class and what was going on and who he was teaching. And I sort of uh, talked him into letting me come today. I really wanted to meet you guys. Um, because soon after you finish your college experience, you're going to come to people like me. Um, people who are in the position to hire you. And so what I wanted to do was share some secrets about what us on this side of the interview desk are wanting and looking for, and hopefully give you some tips that you can use as you go out and try to interview and write resumes and get a job. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm here. Um, I do work at Lincoln Financial, um, so if you haven't done it already, I encourage you to go to lincolnfinancial.com and look us up, especially this person in the front row. I think you will see something for you on the homepage so that uh, you will be very interested in. Uh-huh, you. Yeah, I would do it right now. So <laughs> um, the rest of you uh, should also go there and scroll all the way down to the bottom to the career section. And what you'll find in the career section is not only sort of regular job postings, but also internships and what we call early career um, opportunities. So there's a, a program called the Lincoln Preparation Program. And the Lincoln Preparation Program is for college graduates. It's a two-year program where you're a fully an employee, but you do get uh, special exposure, special care and handling as you go through the organization. Many large companies do that. So if you're getting to in the market to find a job and there's companies that you like, you should go to the career page and see if they have any preparation programs like the one that you will read about when you go to our page. Uh, did you find what I was referring to? Lincoln Financial and Jalen Hurts partner for a better financial future. <laughs> yes. As soon as you walked in. Um, everybody online, you should be on LincolnFinancial.com uh, right now. And if you scroll down, you'll see that uh, we are partnering with Jalen Hurts to try to raise financial awareness among the population, uh, get people to understand how to invest uh, for their retirement. Um, and so for those of you online who do not know this, a person walked into the room today fully decked out in Jalen Hurts uh, gear. Um, and uh, so I wanted to point that out to him. Um, so Ken, I had a question. I know you were gonna put it in the, in the Zoom. Uh, but basically, I would like to um, get an idea from you guys. Uh, how many of you have ever uh, done an interview at all? So have you interviewed for anything? And has it been for something in your career or something not just any, not in, not in your IT career, but in a different, anything else? Yeah. Good. And how many people got it, got the job that they interviewed for? You got a couple of yeses? Oh, cool. Hang on here. We're gonna, we we have this online. If I can figure out where those polls went, the uh... cool. So I said almost in the room anyway. Almost all the hands up and said yes, I have interviewed. So which is great. Which means you probably uh, have some things that you went really well, and some things that were very maybe a little confusing. You don't really know why they were asking you that ah. question, um, and things that we could talk about. Um, so that's what, that was my first question. Just get a lay of the land. Okay. You got it up? Uh, 
No, we are. Now you guys are not online, right? No, no. Got it. Okay. Uh, there. It's online. Got it. It's not as easy as. Oh. Are you going to tell me the results? Well, they want to use the cards. But... And then a foreign language class. What is that thing? Some engineer work overtime. Okay, lots of A's. Lots of A's. You Good. can see over here, well, you can see the oh. online people. Okay. Yes, the uh, class is almost exactly the same. Any people. Yes. All right, that's just end the poll, uh, share the results with the people online. Let's see. Uh, most, well, 50% of the people, well, Oh, 90% of the people, because you can vote more than once. Got it. And class, the clickers, you can only vote once. Not here. Sorry. But yes, uh, if you were clicking online, you could vote more than once. But you, uh, 90% of the people said they, they successfully found a job. Uh, and not 20% said nope. And I, other 10%. Okay. So I'm going to stop share. It. You seen that? Yep. I see it. So. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, and then what was my next question? Pull up the next one. Let's do oh, the next okay. One. Hang on. Oh, the next question. Oh, yeah. now you're going to get tricky. Yeah. The next question. Oh, what's well, the next question? Uh, hold on here. Wait a second. Back, back. What's this? Server? Yeah. Technical issues here. Boy, okay. There we are. We're up and yep. there. Another question. So during the interview I had, I thought some of the questions were confusing, easy, off topic, interesting. You only have one side. You can't hold it up there. Okay. Oh, mixed. Very mixed bag. Uh, Excellent. Yes, you can see the yes. graph there. And uh, let me find whatever happened to Zoom. Oh, okay. And the poll shared the results. Yes, as you can see online, the same thing happened in your class. There is a mixed bag of answers, things quite different. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to run the second. Yeah, that's my third one. Okay, we'll run the last question here. They don't see the title. Yes. Oh, and uh, there. Okay. Got it. If I could have gone back and done it again for the do over, I would have done what? I would have been more prepared. I would have given more details. I would have asked more questions. I would have been less nervous. And a lot of A's uh, and some D's. Okay, let me just. Uh, I would argue that A and D go together. Okay, you don't feel prepared, then you're nervous. All right, and uh, we'll share the results. Although a lot of A's, 
more in life? Yes. Been more prepared. Yes. That sounds like a good idea. Great. Thank you guys for, for playing along. It helps me kind of understand kind of what your level of experience that is and kind of how you've uh, lived through it in the past. So thank you. I'll stand in front of stand in front of here. So um, so I have been interviewing people for jobs at for all levels, whether they're uh, frontline phone reps, team leaders, managers, um, developers, architects, quality analysts um, for years, years and years. So I've probably done hundreds of interviews, um, which I love. I really enjoy interviews, as you can tell, because I made him bring me here. Um, and so, but there's definitely some things that we are all looking for. Us managers are all looking for. And so what I thought I would do is I'd go through, oh, by the way, how much time do I have? We'll, we'll do, uh, don't, we'll bring I have, an hour. I have a half hour. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to give you a couple of sort of pairs, sort of pairs of concepts. So, uh, in general, what I am looking for is two things. Um, I want to see whether uh, I want to evaluate you based on the value that you could bring and the fit to my organization. So that's the first pair, value and fit. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to ask you two kinds of questions, questions about the past and questions about the future. So those are the, two, the second um, pair that I want to talk about. And so what do we mean by those two things? Because I think when you're trying to figure out how to be more prepared, these are the two pairs of things that I want you to think about. Um, so first let's talk about value and fit. So um, what's value? So for where you guys are at as early career talent, we consider you guys um, early career talent. We know that you do not come with 10,000 hours of development experience. We know that you have not, you know, run major pro programs. And so we, the value that we're looking for at your guys stage of the game is potential, right? The value that we're looking for is what potential can you bring to my organization? And so when you look at the questions we're asking you, the question might feel very black and white. Um, tell me a time when you did X. And you might think you have to tell me, well, how good your Java skills are. I'm going to make stuff up. How good your um, UI development skills are, how good your cybersecurity skills are. That's really only part of it. So for potential, that the value I'm looking for is potential, I really wanna know in those experiences, were you a good um, problem solver? Were you a good investigator? Were you good at um, triaging? Were you a good team member? Were you a good at um, trying things out and then learning from that and then trying something else out? Were you good at going out to find people to help you? Because at this point, um, the, the, the education that you guys get here is, is good, but everybody who comes to me has that education. What I really wanna know is what, how can you perform? What can you do with that education? And so, um, so that value that we're looking for, uh, people get nervous, right? So when I ask you like, do you get nervous? People are like, well, I, I've never done that before. I've never done that particular thing before. We know, we all know <laughs> that you guys have not done that. So I quizzed my, um, oh my gosh, he doesn't have his phone on silent. <laughs> um, so uh, in preparation for today, I spoke with my peers, including our lead architect, who has been in that job for 20 plus years, and he's interviewed everybody. And he said, I asked, what messages should I share with you guys? And he said, do not pretend like you know the answer if you don't, because they will know. Every The architects will always know that you're trying to show that you know the answer to something and you don't know. So it's more important that you talk to us about how you would go about finding the answer than saying, oh, I know what to do. I would know what to do in that situation. Um, so does that, do you guys see the difference between those two things? Um, and so I talked about questions about the past and questions about the future. Questions about the past would be that go through your resume and I'll say, oh, I see that you did a summer internship at this place, wherever it was. Uh, tell me tell me about what you did there. And so then you'll start talking 
And if you're not prepared, you'll get nervous. You'll start rambling and you'll be like, oh, I did this and I did this and I did this and this. So the thing that everybody forgets, the thing I'm looking for that I want to share with you is that people will tell us about the, um, they'll tell us about the situation. I was in a summer internship. They asked me to build this new application that tracked this data. Um, and I'll be like, okay, so what happened, right? What people do in interviews is they never give the punchline. Like what's the, so so what? You you did an internship and they asked you to build it. Did you build it? How did it work? Did people like it? Did you get it on time? What did you learn from that experience? So the second biggest thing that I tell people when they interview is you can't just tell what the situation was. You have to also talk about, well, what was that result of that situation? So I built this app and people were able to use it by the end of the summer. It was really great. It wasn't all done. There's a backlog of things that still could be added, but at least uh, I got them a usable piece of software, right? That's a result. That's what we're actually looking for when we ask you the question about tell me a time when. That's the, the most popular interview question in the world is tell me a time when you had to you did something. Uh, tell me a time when you had to you know, code something or you had to solve a problem, whatever that is. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's a, a kind of a big category in value is how do you solve those problems? What kind of questions do you ask? What potential can you bring? So that's where how I look at value. Question. Yep. So I'll repeat the question for the people on time on the, online. The question was, you get, tell me a time when, questions a lot, how do you prepare for that? So there's there's a couple things I would recommend. Number one is um, know what's on your resume. So even if there's only two things on that resume, know those stories. What are the stories that go with what you have on your resume? And so it's almost like you interview yourself in advance. So you have an example on your resume. Well, what are all the questions somebody could ask me about this thing, right? And you prepare for that. So um, there's an acronym that we use called STAR, Situation, Tasks, Actions, and Results, S-T-A-R. So you go through every one of your resume items and ask yourself those questions. Can I articulate what was a situation? What were the tasks I had to do? What actions did I take? And what were the results? So that's what you would do in an interview. On your resume, you do the same exact thing, but you do it backwards. So in a resume, you only got so many words, right? So it starts out with the result. So saved a million dollars by building this application or fixing this problem or whatever the case may be. Yes. So situation, task, actions, and result. And again, result is the punchline. Um, ex people with 10 years of work experience still forget to tell you the punchline. And if you're curious like me, I might probe you a little bit. So what happened, right? You're like, oh yeah, I forgot the punchline. Like this is why it matters. So, so for the tell me a time questions, the first thing you do is you go through your own resume and you make sure that you can fully explain everything about those experiences what you learned, what problems you had, what was the situation, what were those tasks and actions, what was the result? And the result could be, I saved somebody time, I saved somebody money, I gave them a new tool, whatever I did. And then also what were the problems? Because as a manager, I want people who can solve problems, not people who are waiting around to be told what to do, right? If you're waiting around to be told what to do next, I don't need you, I got other guys, I can do that, right? So. So that's the first thing you do for the tell me a time. The second thing you do is you then look at the job posting and you say, well, what are they hiring for? And what do you think th those problems are? And then you look for matches. So you just, you have your resume and you have the job posting and you say, well, where did I have that experience? Where, what can I connect, right? So that when, as an interviewer, I'm gonna pull something out of the job posting and say, this is really important to me. 
And I want to know whether how you would approach it or if you've ever had any experience with it. So does that help? Good, good questions. Any other questions? Um, I don't know, Ken, if the online people can ask me questions. Oh, okay, we'll hear them. Okay, cool. Well, you people online, please speak up. Okay, so we talked about value, right? What is what is that value? The other thing I mentioned in the pairing was fit. So what does that mean, fit? Um, and uh, I don't have, I can't ask this question for input, but but fit is kind of like, do I think you're going to fit with my team? Do I think you're going to fit with me? Do I think you're going to fit with the with the company? Do I think you're going to fit with the job that we need to do? So fit is very squishy, right? It's not, you can't take a class and get an A in fit. It's really hard. And so this is where um, you guys can do a lot on your side of the table as you're interacting with me and you're interacting with the other people who are on the on the interview. A lot of times in technical IT interviews, it's not one-on-one, -on -one, it's a panel. So you'll have an architect, a developer, and a manager. They'll all be in there interviewing you. And so fit, the way that you can influence fit is really by paying attention to what they're interested in, right? So if an architect comes out and he wants to ask you questions about cybersecurity, right? Well, you've done a lot of things, but one of the things you're studying is cybersecurity. So do you have examples? Can you talk about cybersecurity in your interview? Can you ask them questions about cybersecurity? There's lots of ways that they're signaling to you. We're all signaling to you all the time what we're most interested in by the questions we ask you. Um, especially in technical interviews, it will be more of a conversation so the architect will ask you a question and you'll start answering it and then he'll throw in another spin. Okay, well, what about this? And what about that? And it'll become a dialogue. And um, that, that dialogue is almost as important as the content of your answer. Because from a fit perspective, are you a person that I'll be able to work with, right? Do you have ideas that you're gonna bring to the table? Um, or are you just waiting to be told the answer? So, so there's those two dimensions, sort of, so value and fit is, uh, is the two dimensions. And then the other um, pair that I had mentioned was the past and the future. So the future questions are like case studies. So some people like to give questions, um, I have a problem. And so a lot of times these problems are problems that we're having today. The problem that they're actually having um, in their group, the problem that I'm having in my group today. And, uh, and so in a future problem, the pressure, you guys can feel nervous because like, oh my gosh, I have to come up with the right answer. Cold, right? That's really, really hard. That's not actually what I'm looking for. So again, when I say I came to talk about the question behind the question, what we're really looking for is you have been faced with a cold problem how would you go about just investigating that, right? And so it's actually the same star. It's the same four letters. So I say to you, I've got a problem in my environment today. Um, you start questioning me. Okay, Katie, what's the situation? Tell me the situation. And you start asking me questions. That's really what I'm looking for. Not can you pop out the right answer without asking any questions, but can you ask me questions? And so you ask questions and then that gets you down the road. Okay, well then what are the tasks that I might do now that I've asked you some questions? What are the, what are the actions I might take? Um, those future focused questions are really about us trying to understand your thought process. Do you have a methodical way that you will go out and try to triage a problem? Um, and so it's the exact same star. It's just now you're turning the tables. So um, any questions on, from anybody online? Any questions online? Okay. Um, the third area, so, so an interview in general has three parts. So the first part is an intro. They'll want you to say, you know, I've got your resume in front, but tell me about, you know, your history. You give a brief, brief history. We'll ask a bunch of questions. And then there's the third part of the interview. The third part of the interview is often really overlooked, 
by people, but it's uh, again, very important. And it's where we say, do you have any questions for us? And a lot of people who made it that far, they're like, no, I'm, I'm good. I got everything. And that's not what we want to hear. <laughs> what we really want to hear is we want to hear what questions do you have about coming to work here? What questions do you have about the company? What questions do you have about the job, about me as your manager? Yes. How they think I did. Okay. Because I don't feel like I got a good answer. Yep. They didn't really answer the question. Yes. Oh man, I never had that person. I never had someone asking that. So for those of you guys online, the question was asked. Um, the question that they asked their interviewer. Um, how how I did and like what I could work on to be better with the community. Yes. Yeah. So um so the question that he that that they asked in their interview at the end of their interview was um how did I do on the interview and um what could I have done better? So my suggestion to you is not to ask that question again. Um that's not appropriate at the end of the interview. There's another moment later where you can make that kind of um request not in the interview itself. I wouldn't do in the interview itself. Um, so you you need to use those minutes of the interview. It's still showing me that you would be a great candidate. You're still trying to like prove to me you're a great candidate. So you wanna ask questions that show me you're really interested in working here. So have you been out to my company website? Do you know who my CEO is? Do you know what's a, do you know that Jalen Hurts is on the cover? Do you know, uh, what are your questions? So you want to ask questions. Uh, the thing about an interview is that we're interviewing you, but you also need to think that you're interviewing us. You may not want to work for us. You may not like us. And so what's important to you? Those are questions that you can ask, right? So there's different kinds of questions that you can ask. You have a question. There, so th these are great questions. So the question was that, is pay a terrible question to ask? Um, yes, pay is not a great question to ask for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the people who are interviewing you may not have any control over that. So if, if the architect and the developer are asking you questions, they, they don't have any control over that. Um, so yeah, the the well, we can talk about salary negotiation as a separate thing, but it's not in the interview. Salary negotiation is later. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so the question is still about pay and um, especially about how people answer it. So um, salary negotiation is a skill, uh, like a separate skill after this whole answering the interview questions. Different companies do it different ways. Every company does it a slightly different way. So, and I honestly don't know the answer to this. On my external, on the internal uh, career job posting page, we have the, the salary ranges, sort of the mins and the max. I don't even know if we have that on the public site. So what you guys could get access to. Internally, we have the ranges. Um, externally, I'm, I'm not sure whether we even do or not. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Um, State jobs only. Yes, public jobs, state jobs, they they will always have the the ranges. So it's important for you to know kind of what the range of a of a job is, right? You might say, well, I'm not interested in that job, but you know, it doesn't pay enough. Um, but the negotiation would happen after we decide that we want you as a candidate, right? So the way it typically works is, let's say you get through the interviews and we like you and we want you. My And the way it works at Lincoln is my HR person will call you and says, Katie really likes you. She'd like you to come. 
the starting pay is $90,000 with two weeks of vacation and whatever. And then you can decide whether you that's acceptable or not. Um, if you say, well, you know, can you do any better? Is there something more? You know, I was really looking for 95,000. I was whatever the case may be. Um, she'll come back to me. The HR woman will come back to me and they'll say, well, this person really wants $5,000 more. Can you do it? So I, the, I have a budget. I can only spend so much money. And so I can decide whether I can afford that or I can't afford that. So that's when the negotiation part is happening. So as far as understanding where it sort of meets your minimum, um, you know, let's say that may, let's say you didn't know you were posting for a job and the job only pays forty thousand dollars a year, and you're like, well, that's not even enough to cover my rent. <laughs> you know, like I can't like I can't apply for that job. Um, that's a that's a little bit tougher, um, especially in the external market when you're not inside a company already and you can't see all the salary ranges. You rely on things like the job title and the job role. So if it's called a developer, or it's called a an analyst or it's called a consultant. That's how you kind of externally get the ranges in there. Um, and the early stages of the game, people are only going to give you ranges. You're never going to get down to that specific salary number until we decide we'd like to hire you. We being anybody, not just Lincoln. Question. The question is how many back and forths can you have on the negotiation? Um, not a lot, um, one or two, probably. So, um, so sometimes uh, the way I've handled it in some of my past things is I can't raise the salary, but I can um, give you a signing bonus, or I can change the um, the bonus pay. Right, the bonus. Our, most companies' bonuses are based on a percentage of your salary. Let's say it's five percent. Maybe I raise that to ten percent based on your years of experience and the things that you bring to the table. Um, in some cases, especially not for early career talent, but mid-career talent, sometimes mid-career talent will say, the salary is not great, but can you throw in more vacation time? I'm like, yeah, I can throw in more vacation time. So we can do it that way, right? So there's other things that can be negotiated besides just the flat dollar amount. There's a salary, there's your bonus structure, there's PTO time. There used to be things like company cars and stuff. We don't do that anymore. Nobody does that. But yeah, but not not a ton of negotiating. Once or twice. Twi the second time around should be clarification. Yep. Good questions. So uh, back to the whole idea of uh, the questions you should be asking me. So the questions you should be asking me are questions that um, show that you are interested in what your work experience is going to be like. What's my team like? Uh, what's the culture? Uh, what's your leadership style? Um, what kinds of things uh, do you think I'll be working on in the first six months or in the first year? You want things that show that you're curious about actually working in my group. I'm the hiring manager in that case, right? And that you're interested in what's going on in the company. So you might ask questions about, the Jalen Hurt situation or the the rebranding, which is right on page one of our website, things that show you're interested in the company. Um, in the interview itself, you, you're not asking questions about um, your creature comforts. So creature comforts are like, do I get a cube or do I get an office? Uh, can I start at 10 o'clock instead of nine o'clock? Um, those are those are kind of in the creature comfort category. And that is not going to um differentiate you in a positive way. So I would skip the creature comfort ones. Um, I also would skip the ones we started with, which is uh, how did I do on this interview? You're, you People have asked me that. You're not the first one to come up with that. Um, it puts the people that you're talking to in an awkward situation to write, to have to, to basically, you're basically saying, tell me right now whether I got it. That's really what you're asking. Because if I give you anything other than you were excellent, then I'm starting to say, well, okay, why am I not hiring this guy? What kind of feedback can I give him? Then I'm gonna give him that feedback. Yes, Ken. You asked, who might I find out to be going from here? Um, yes, yes, you can say that. When, when might I find out? Um, and you might say, when can I find out the next steps? Uh, when can I find out whether I'm going to be moving on to the next round? Um, yes, timing question, definitely. You can definitely ask. Um, 
a very old fashioned thing, but I think is uh, appropriate, especially given the question is um, thank you notes, right? So sometimes you get to an interview and you get all the way to the end and you're like, you know, we were talking about something and uh, I've got some information to share with Katie. We were talking about this and, you know, I'm going to send her this. So you send me an email with a thank you note. You know, thanks for interviewing me today. I really appreciate it. Here's a link to that information we were talking about. I hope you like it. Something like that. That goes a long way. That goes a long way to say, this person was really engaged in talking to me today. And he remembered, you know, he's thoughtful about what we were talking about. I shared this link to this, you know, interesting piece of information. That would be the point in that thank you note that you said, you know, in the event that I don't move on, um, I would really appreciate any feedback you have. You know, any feedback you have about how I could improve my interview skills or improve my answers to the questions, whatever. That would be the place where you would ask that question. All right, other questions. Um, so of the three parts, I would say the third part is, um, it can expand and contract the most. So let's say the interview is supposed to go for a 30 minutes and you didn't get to step three. They weren't done quizzing. I wasn't done quizzing you until minute 28. So now you've only got two minutes left, right? You may have prepared a, a nice amount of questions to ask me and you're just not going to get to them all. That's a, that's fine. I wouldn't freak out about like, I didn't have a great act three, right? Because we just ran out of time. Um, that part, that's not a problem. So all three parts are important. Um, I would remember that you're, uh, you're competing against a lot of other people who you don't know. You have no idea what they're bringing to the table. And so sometimes when we get rejected, I've been rejected a lot. I feel like, why didn't they like me? <laughs> why, what didn't I do well? Sometimes you do everything right. And there's something about that connection that somebody else made and they pick another person. Um, you never know how many people you're competing against. So I'm about out of time. Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. I might mention I uh, did talk to a couple other friends who are managers who hire people. I yeah, try to give them hints what to hire. Somebody said, well, tell them to wear a clean shirt, which seems pretty obvious. But look, go ahead. Uh, if you're doing a Zoom interview, do something about the back room, bath, the background. Don't show them your bedroom with dirty laundry. Uh, you can do better. Uh, and look at the interview. If it's in person or if it's a Zoom interview. If it's a Zoom interview, one of the hints is to get a picture of the person, put it right behind the camera so you look at them. Do a question here. Okay, talk about the uh -huh. But um, regarding past and future, talk about past and like, you know, talk about like, what you were good at during a certain point in time in the situation. But like the future, what is the job of doing? I think you were going to So the future questions that we could ask would be, um, I call them like a case study. And so a case study would be like, um, how would you handle this issue? So I'm going to give you a problem that we're having in, you know, my department right now. How would you handle that issue? So that's sort of future focused. Um, and so you can rightly say, well, I've never done that before, but here's some questions I would ask. Here's some things I might think about. And then maybe I might try that first, you know? So, uh, so the future focused questions are really not about us wanting to know whether you have that specific content knowledge. It's about problem solving skills, right? It's about, can you, can you ask, ask in intelligent questions? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was applying the star, my, my star analogy on a resume. So the resume is like an interview, but it's on paper in that we're looking for the same things. I am looking for 
um, what res results you drove, uh, what accomplishments you had in your experiences and kind of what were they about? And so um, if I had a, an example of resume, it'd be easier to show, but um, in a resume, you typically have, you know, I worked at this company, this was my job, and these are some of my, the things that I did. People put a lot of things on the resume. They're like, I participated in this project. I showed up to this thing. That's only the situation. They're not giving, okay, I participated in this project where the problem was to build this app that did it and we were able to deliver it successfully, right? And so the resume also needs to include the whole story in that one little bullet. Yeah, it's a it's an art form for sure so but i think i'm getting the hook yeah <laughs> uh, I, I might mention the library and the internet google is full of answers to your questions and i strongly recommend you to go out and look at information about writing a good resume look at information about doing an interview or writing a cover letter i remember when I was coming to A&T, I thought, okay, I got the resume down. I looked at that. And I had to write, those days you write cover letters. I wonder if there's anything about that. Went out to the library, found a book, and oh, they said, never do this. I had been doing it. So I changed my cover letter. It's good work. Got the job. Okay. Well, thank you very much, thank Ms. You. Todd. Thank and you that's much. it again on, we're doing a malware on Monday, oh, Monday. Don't come to class on Wednesday. It's Wellness Day. Have fun. Be well.